I had two older sisters that I kind of looked up to, and and for them having the chance to travel nationally and internationally, you know, my Whitney was on a national team with people I looked up to, and and you know, she would always come back with like autographs and stuff, and I was like, I want to do that. I want to be on those teams. I want to travel the world, and and. At that point, I was just like, you know, I want to be an Olympic gold medalist, I want to break a world record, and I want to be a professional athlete. And those goals that I thought about every single day kept me coming week after week and year after year until I was able to accomplish it. What struck us most about Michael when we met him all those years ago was his dedication to the long hours in the pool. It's one reason why we train seven days a week, why we train on Christmas, why we train on Thanksgiving, 365 days a year. There aren't many clubs that train seven days a week, so that gives you one extra set training session every single week where you can pick something up. So, I mean, if I'm getting 52 more practices than everybody else is, and that's kind of make that little or big difference in the end. What do you feel separates good athletes from the best athletes? Um, I think it comes back to what I was saying earlier about, I mean, I think it's, a lot of it is mental. Um, you know, if you want to do something and you want it that bad, you'll make sacrifices. And, you know, growing up for me as a kid, I made a lot of sacrifices that I didn't seem that they were a big deal and I don't seem they, like, I don't, I don't think of them as, as being a big deal right now. You know, there were Saturdays or Fridays where, you know, I'd give up going to a dance or hanging out with my friends because I had work out the next day. But those things that I gave up, you know, were things that I wanted to, to help me get to my goal. And, and there were times where I put, you know, I've, I've been put in uncomfortable situations, but I've used my mental power, my mental strength to push through it. I think that's how you, you know, you can look at any of the athletes in the world. I mean, Tiger, the guy has a, a busted knee and still comes and destroys the rest of the field. You know, that's the thing. It's like people don't make excuses. Some of the best athletes or the greatest athletes in the world do things when they're uncomfortable. You know, everybody can compete when they're feeling good, happy, excited, rested. But it's the best people who can overcome when they're tired, sore, not in the great mind, you know, not in the best mindset. And I think mental power that the greatest athletes have can push all the pain aside. You know, and I mean, like when I was doing that Navy SEALs thing, it, was it easy for me to do it? No. Was it easy for me to climb over a 45-foot wall and look down? Not at all, and I'm afraid of heights. But, you know, I, I said to myself, I'm going to do this and no one's going to stop me. And I think that's the biggest thing, is how strong you can be mentally. But I think that really shows who the person is. So I think that's one thing that separates the good from the greatest. I think that just keep the, I guess, keep the ball rolling. Um, I like to, I guess, have some more best times in other events, maybe get close to world records in those, I don't know. Um, I think that I just, my, one of my long-term goals is to win the gold medal in Athens and go on more than one event. So, I mean, I have a lot of goals, but I think that I just want to take it day by day. Michael Phelps was a force of nature who was preparing to take on the world and win his first Olympic medal at that year's Athens Games. He stood six foot four with a wingspan of six foot seven. The then 18 year old had already established himself as the world's fastest ever all round swimmer. And at this stage in his career, he held three world records and three world titles. But his big aim was to win Olympic gold in Athens, and not just one. He was looking to equal or even exceed Mark Spitzer's record haul of seven gold medals from the 1972 Olympics. Many, including Australia's Ian Thorpe, thought Phelps's mission impossible. I think if he said that, then it means that sort of he thinks that he can't do it. Um, I don't think it's impossible for anybody. I, mean, I think if you really just have a a wide open mind and use your imagination, I think a lot of things are possible. I think of myself as, as the greatest person that I can be, that's it. I'm not going to go out of my, you know, out on the limb and say I'm the greatest this or that. I, I just, I was a kid with a dream, that's it. And, and um, you know, the people before me set the bar so high and, and I was a little kid that wasn't afraid to dream as big as I could. And that's really it. I, you know, like you said, like we were talking before, I, I was dedicated, I was hardworking, and that put me in the shoes where I am now.
you know, ever since I've moved to, to Arizona, it, it's, it's been so wild to me to see so many people that have come up and just been supportive. Uh, and, and I think that's something really special because it goes hand, it goes back to what I wanted to do with the sport. And being able just to know that this person or that person is watching in a random bar down the street or a random restaurant down the street. Um, I've changed things in the sport and I've done what I've wanted to do. And there are people back home when we are overseas that are screaming their brains out. And there's nothing cooler like, like when I come home and hear just the stories from them. Um, and those little times, you know, could change someone's life, could pick somebody up. It's just an honor for me. This time, his retirement is for real, even though he claimed the same thing after London. I remember saying to you, are you done? You said, I'm done, I'm done. I said, the great ones never retire. Really Jordan, question, Sugar Ray, you said, no, no, no. But you were uh, you were bummed. You weren't you weren't loving swimming at that time. I hated it. I wanted nothing to do with the sport then, and that's why I came back. I didn't I, I didn't want to end my career like that. Um, but I had to find the passion myself again, and and I found that again. And I had fun, and this was this is how I wanted to finish. How I, what I did here is the best. What happened in since London and Rio in those couple of years that turned the lights back on? Um, I guess I just started being me and found who I was and was happy with who I am and that's what everybody's gonna see and that's what everyone has seen over the last two years. Me being me and being a kid and loving what I'm doing and um, you know, being able to start a family. There were a lot of mixed feelings after that race. I wasn't happy with the time. But afterwards, I, like, I, I saw the time and I was like, man, that's really, like, I'm not happy with that. And then I realized that I had made my fifth Olympic team. And, you know, that was something that, that after London I didn't think was possible. Um, taking some time off, going through some ups and downs, and being able to get through the obstacles that I had to be able to have the chance to swim on my fifth Olympic team. Um, it's just special to not only be on the team again and represent my country, uh, but also have the chance to, to have my son come and watch. Um, my last swims ever. Uh, you might not remember them, but I'll have the memories for life. I don't. I, I don't really live the normal life as a teenager. I mean, I get a lot of. Or I give. I guess I give up a lot of things. But I mean, I'm getting tons and tons of other things that normal 15 year olds aren't getting. So I think that. I think this is a life that anyone could dream of, and I'm definitely loving.